So we'd like to welcome all of you to the uh, State Street Forum. The State Street Forum is co-hosted by Westminster Presbyterian Church and the New York State Council of Churches. And the council has its offices, as it turns out, at Westminster Presbyterian Church. And together, we're just steps from the Capitol uh, uh, in downtown Albany. We uh, conceived of this forum as a place where we can gather to talk about pressing legislative and policy matters as it impacts the capital region and many other localities around the state, the state as a whole, the nation and the world from a faith perspective. And we will aim to bring to this forum guests who can offer special insight and expertise to help us understand an issue. We'll have a lead speaker and then someone always who will offer a faith reflection in response. These presentations will be followed by a discussion with those on the call, followed by a few suggestions of concrete steps that you and your congregation can take to act on the policy area discussed. Reverend Heather Kirk Davidoff, pastor at Westminster Presbyterian Church, and me, Peter Cook, executive director of the New York State Council of Churches, will be serving as the hosts for the State Street Forum. And so before um, we uh, move on, I would now like to introduce my co-host, Heather, who will share with us a word about the forum and also introduce today's speakers. Well, welcome everybody. As I was saying, this is sort of a, has been a, 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 a dream of Peter's and mine for really several years prior to my time coming uh, to Westminster. Um, I was working with the council uh, working with Peter, and we kind of brainstormed about an event like this, some kind of ongoing forum. Of course, at that time, we were thinking about having it in person and all sitting around and having bag lunch together and something like that. But now we don't we do not do that kind of thing anymore, I guess. And so now we are uh, going to give this a try on Zoom, and perhaps it will stay on Zoom, or perhaps it will eventually return to State Street in its physical format. At least uh, some people might be here physically while others are still with us virtually. We are doing this both as a live event and as a recording that we'll be able to share on the council's website and um, Westminster will have it on our website uh, and on our YouTube channel and it will be available for churches in the area who would like to perhaps use this to provoke conversation as an adult uh, discussion or study or something like that. We have two really terrific uh, speakers this morning, both of whom are uh, friends of uh, uh, the councils and friends of mine. Uh, <laughs> and uh, welcome both to um, Mark and to Fred. Uh, just a quick word of introduction, Mark. Emanation is known uh, to many in this area because he has been a community activist and a labor activist uh, in the capital region and beyond for many years. I um, the first uh, was a kind of acquainted with Mark when he was working uh, for Citizen Action. He's now the director of the Capital District Area Labor Federation which is a, a coalition of over 130,000 uh, union members across the, uh, in 11 counties around Albany, New York. But he's also very much involved with issues related to hunger. And I know he'll talk more about this. He is a board member, both of Hunger Action New York and uh, the community, the Oakwood Community Center Food Pantry in Troy. Um, he's also a really 
fantastic musician and band leader. And so many of you may have encountered him in uh, when he was wearing that hat. And just a quick word about Fred Bohr, who will be our respondent. Fred is the executive director of the Focus Churches of Albany. Uh, uh, Westminster Presbyterian is one of six um, Focus Church uh, churches, and there's a number of other related faith communities. Focus um, uh, is provides um, uh, food among doing other things in the city of Albany. Focus runs uh, two food pantries and a breakfast program. Fred probably will say more about that. He comes to Focus uh, from a wide uh, range of a uh, 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 varied background, uh, working in um, ministerial settings, church settings, and in college settings. Um, most recently, he was the director of service learning at the College of St. Rose. Uh, but he's also a, a founding member of Emmaus House, the Catholic Worker House uh, in Albany, uh, located in our city's South End. So welcome to Fred, and I'll hand it over to Mark. Let me make sure I get the spotlighting right here. There you go. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really happy to be here. Uh, and I'm honored to be asked to do this. Uh, and I know everybody says that they're honored or, you know, to be asked to do this. But the fact that um, something that really means a lot to me um, means a lot to you folks enough that they, you want to talk about it and be involved in it, um, I, I just think it, it's great. Um, I grew up in Waterville, New York. I grew up, I was born in 1957, and uh, we were a poor family, and we lived in the projects in Waterville. Waterville was a working class town, still is. Um, at one point, it had a lot of factories, and all of those factories, one by one, closed down. But even when those factories were open, it wasn't like there was a middle class in Waterville. There wasn't wealthy folks. It was just a working class city on the Hudson River. Uh, and over the course of my life, um, my family um, used food pantries um, in Philadelphia and in Louisville, Kentucky, and in here, when, back, back here. I went to school in the University of Minnesota uh, in the 70s when working class kids could go to school for pretty much free. I then went to work in Philadelphia for the Amalgamated Clothing and Textile Workers Union. I moved to Louisville to work for them. I moved to Boston to work for them. And then I moved back here in 1991. And since 91, um, through my life as a musician and a community activist, and then the different jobs I've had, I've raised a good amount of money and awareness for food pantries and for food banks. Um, partly because I, we used them when I was a kid, used them in other points of my life, and partly because uh, I'm a historian and I saw what was happening in the country and in, and in the world. One thing I want to point out is that from 1946, 47, after the Second World War to 1980, there really wasn't food pantries in the United States. There were soup kitchens that were, you know, for folks that had... Um, uh, problems with substance abuse. There was, you know, some home missions and homeless shelters, but very little. In 1980, the federal government under President Ronald Reagan um, slashed the uh, self social safety net by 67%. I was living in Philly at the time. And one week it was normal. And then the next week there was homeless people everywhere. They closed the uh, old soldiers' homes down. They did all sorts of things. And then you had people that were just in desperate need. Um, when you think about that time period, there was other things that took place besides the slashing of social services. Reagan went after the Air Traffic Controllers Union. And then when he broke that strike of the, it was called the PACO strike, um, when he broke that strike, one attack after another was wholesale attacks on unions. And um, the, the, the machinists lost at Eastern Airlines, the miners lost, the paper workers lost up in Maine, um, international paper workers, all of those things were happening around the exact same time. And 
with the attacks on the unions, there was cuts in wages and benefits and a, a, and a huge amount of um, a, a more people in under the poverty level. So uh, now, unlike um, from 46 uh, to 1980, we have um, over 60,000 food pantries in the United States. And that's what they know. That's what they report on. Over 200 food banks and over six, 60,000 food pantries. In New York State, we have 5,000 food pantries. Um, and somewhere with the job that I have now in 2019 at our annual meeting, the unions in the capital region adopted the food pantries for the capital district and the regional food bank. We did a survey of our members and 20% of our members, 20% of them were going to food pantries, our hotel workers, our restaurant workers, the folks that were working in um, nursing homes, um, the people that were working as uh, uh, in groceries, as cashiers. These are union members that weren't making enough money to live and needed to augment what their family ate by going to food pantries. So we adopted them. We wanted to raise some money for them. We wanted to raise some awareness. We raised our own awareness by studying um, and learning about the United Way's Alice. Uh, and I'll get into that a little bit later on. Um, but we also wanted to, you know, a food pantry that are all in these, for the most part, church basements and other things, community centers. If you need a plumber to hook up a new freezer, if you need an electrician, if you need a carpenter, a painter, we could match you up and try to do it, get volunteers. That's what we tried to do. So then when the pandemic hit, we were ready politically, mentally, um, uh, that to, uh, to, to say, like, let's throw ourselves into this. And we had gone, we went to the food, regional food bank with a check for $5,000 to donate to their efforts. And we learned about the mass food distributions. I went and shadowed one of the best organizers I've ever worked with in my life, Sister Betsy Van Dusen, um, who was carrying these things out. And um, I learned how she did it and then realized that I couldn't do it by myself and needed her help. We did our first one last June and um, we've continued to do it. After the first one that we did, um, and we had tons of trade unionists and we raised money and fed a lot of people, uh, we realized that building a coalition with the regional food bank and um, the CC Move, which is uh, the program for Catholic charities and anyone else we could build something with, that, that we needed to build that coalition to feed people. So um, here's, if you've not been to a mass food distribution, here's what happens. A truck or two trucks, big trucks, drop off either 14 tons of food or 28 tons of food for the bigger ones that we do. Volunteers, anywhere between 30 and 100 or so, sort that food and we put them in boxes and bags and we have stations and people that can, if it's a place where people can walk up, they walk up to get food. If they um, need to, they drive up to get food, which is mostly, and then they have contact lists. We ask them only a couple questions. How many, how many families you're picking up for? How many people are in the families? What's your zip code so we can track it? We don't ask them about their backstory. We don't ask them why they're there. We just ask them, you know, and we also welcome them to say, thanks so much for coming today. We're all in this together. I'm on this side of the bag this week. You're on that side. Vice next week could be the opposite of that. And, uh, we feed between normally about 600 families at each one of these things. I've been at ones like at Hudson Valley Community College. We've fed over 800 families, 800 cars, 500 cars lined up before the truck got there and we turned away 200 cars. I've been at ones that, you know, you walk up and there's a grandmother there and her daughter is sick with COVID in Florida and sends her five grandchildren, the oldest one 12, up on a bus from Florida without an adult. You know, I have three kids and a grandchild. I would never want to be in that position. And the grandmother said, without this food, I don't know what we would do this week. So that's how we do it and that's why we do it. And on March 23rd of this year, we did our hundredth since last March. Um, and we've done dozens since. We did one Tuesday this week. I got another one Friday in Albany. Uh, we got a couple every single week. 
And every time we do it, I feel really good about it and really bad about it. I feel how in the richest country in the history of the world do we have this many people that need food to survive? What are the reasons on this and what can we do about it? Because as much as um, we've built a good coalition and we have all these volunteers and we have churches and community groups and unions and all this stuff, this is really like, well, there was times into this winter where a six blow zero and the wind was blowing and you're going, how are we doing this? And how many more times can we do this? And so um, we're always talking about what next? What can we do about this? How can you change the system that we're in? So we want to look at it. One of the things I think we could change is how the federal government determines that people are poor. Um, right now, a per, one person household, if you make less than $15,000, $14,880 to be exact, you're deemed poor. If you make $14,881, you're not deemed poor. Family of four, $25,260. Now I live right now in Troy and uh, the average studio apartment is $1,000. There's no possible way a family of four can live on $25,000. Just no way. Um, so I, and everything's determined by this. How much money for Head Start, HEAP, uh, Child Health Plus, how much jobs and job training, SNAP, WIC, school food programs, um, weatherization, all of this stuff, legal services report, all of this is determined on this federal archaic ridiculous thing that says a family of four can live in the capital region for $25,000. Not just for four here, a family of four in New York City, a family of four anywhere. Um, to make matters worse, many states in this country, 23, still have the federal minimum wage. Pennsylvania, and I lived in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania's minimum wage is $7.25 an hour. Philly, Pittsburgh, I don't care whether you were in Erie or Allentown, there's no possible way you could live on seven twenty-five an hour. Uh, now, officially, the federal government says then about 11% of our population, this is before the pandemic, about 11% of our population is poor. I think that anybody that says that should be ashamed of themselves just straight up ashamed. Then now once again, the richest country in the history of the world, we have about 35 million people that are poor. That like, I, you know, I didn't cause it, but that I just like go, oh, how do I live here that that's, that's happening? Since the pandemic, they've added another 8 million to 10 million under the poverty level. So, you know, it's about half the population when you add all that up. Um, and what I mean by that is if you look at the actual real poverty, you look at the United Way's Alice, which is assets limited, income constrained, employed, the working poor, you look at that, you look at, you add in statistics that they don't count are 11 million to 12 million undocumented folks that are living poor, 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 and you add all of that together, um, it's about half the population. And uh, when you look deeper in the statistics, twice as many blacks as whites, more Latinos, more women-led households, rural and urban, real big, you know, there's sections of the rural countryside and we've been doing a lot of these food drives in rural areas. They didn't recover from the 2008 um, recession, Never mind this one. There's no jobs there, there's nothing to do. And so you join the military, you come back, and you still have no jobs there, even though you did what you were, you were told that this will get you a job. Um, 75 million people approximately during the pandemic lost their job. Uh, they, these are government estimates. 24 million have experienced hunger more than they had before. And 6 million are right on the brink of being housing insecure, or as we used to say, homeless. Um, I live in Troy. 
26.1% of the population in Troy live under the federal poverty level. And the Alice, it's 52%. Um, when you look at the United Way's version of it. We have big institutions in Troy. We used to have lots of jobs. There used to be 10,000 union garment jobs there, garment workers. Um, but we have big institutions in Troy who pay absolutely no taxes. Russell Sage, RPI, Emma Willard, Trinity Healthcare, they don't pay any taxes. Everything else is then spread out amongst homeowners and renters who pay these taxes for very little services. And like I said before, you've got these, you know, places, you, you've got flats. I delivered lunches last summer to places in um, the poorest sections of Troy, like not North Central, which is one of the 10 poorest neighborhoods in the United States. And you got 12 people living in a three bedroom, one bath, which is unhealthy in every possible way in order to be able to function rent wise. The flip side of this, and I don't know how I'm running out of time, Heather, you should just say, Mark, you're running out of time. Flip side of this is the wealthy are doing real well. They increase their wealth, the 651 billionaires in the United States by over a trillion dollars in this year. The guy who owns Amazon made this past year during the pandemic $8 million a minute, a minute. Um, in New York State, we have 118 or so billionaires. A billion dollars is $1,000 million. I know what I do with a million. When I walk my dog and we talk about like my, me and my dog talk about hitting the lottery, what I do with a million, two million starts getting sketchy, $1,000 million is obscene. You can't earn it. You could be the best heart surgeon in the world and you couldn't earn it. And you can't really actually spend it. So um, it's just obscene. Our top 25 billionaires in New York State, it's interesting when you look at what they do, some of them are media moguls like Murdoch and Bloomberg. A lot of them are financial just people like the only the Apollo group. They're hedge fund people. They're like professional gamblers with the lives of and fortunes of millions of people. And some are in fashion. And then, then there's the Koch brothers. As you can tell, I don't spend a lot on fashion. Um, the thing that's key about all this is they don't pay taxes. They have over 90,000 people working for them to hide to, they spend millions of dollars to hide their billions of dollars so they don't have to pay taxes. And there's a price to this when they don't pay taxes. So what do we do? Well, first of all, I don't think we just look at the United States. I think we got to look that over 40% of the world lives on less than $5 and 50 cents a day. And about 200 million people in the world live on less than $1.50 a day. And the same companies that don't pay taxes here are the companies that are working around the world. And I think it's important for us to all like pay attention to that. But you could do a whole bunch of things if you tax these people, not just here, but around the world to alleviate the people, the conditions of people living in poverty. And actually, you could actually change these conditions to where there wasn't people living in poverty. You could raise wages and raise benefits. If you think about like wages, we're now stuck at 1250 upstate and upstate's defined, you know, pretty much from Poughkeepsie to Buffalo, Plattsburgh to Binghamton, 1250, it's stuck there. And there's no discussion even. We all work, many of us, I can see here on the fight for 15, many of us. And we used to say, what do you want? 15, when do you want it now? Well, 1250, not now, 15. And this is in New York State. I believe we need massive infrastructure stuff. And the way everyone defines it, including unions, is roads, bridges, and broadband, internet. I'm all for that. I think we need about 100,000 mental health counselors in New York State. I think we need like healthcare clinics in every single possible place, free healthcare clinics that did dental, eyes, and mental health everywhere. I think we need um, housing. I, my mother always said to me, you know, we lived in the projects, but it was transitional housing until you get, you know, get your feet underneath you. 
I look back at it, it was actually airy, safe. It was bricks. It was cooperative, like dinners and cooperative daycare, you know, embryonic and like just the begin beginning, but real unorganized. But some mothers stayed home and some mothers went to work and everybody worked together to have a good life. We need that all over the place. They haven't built any kind of public housing of any kind of sort since the 1970s in this country. There's no, we, we need, we can't just put rent control, I'm all for it, but if rent control is 2% a year on $1,400 a month for a one bedroom, it's not helping anybody. Okay, Mark, I'm giving yes. you your, your time to start to land the plane. Okay, so I'm, I'm getting, I'm getting done with it. So I believe we need to tax these folks like we, we used to. I mean, if you look under President Eisenhower, it was about an 80, 82% tax. And they didn't let buildings um, in the Cayman Islands be the corporate headquarters for 100, 100 different U.S. corporations. I believe that we need to, um, the trillion dollars that we're spending around the world to drop bombs on people's heads, we should spend that money around the world and here helping alleviate poverty. And I believe we have to be honest about what we're up against. Um, and we're up against a government that works for a wealthy class that has a system that says this is acceptable. Um, and in closing, I always remember one thing that Malcolm X, um, when he got back from Africa's the second trip, and a reporter said to him at the airport, they said, are you trying to wake people up to their oppression? And he said, I'm trying to wake them up to their self-worth. And if we were woke up to our collective self-worth, we wouldn't put up with this for another day. Thanks. Awesome. Thanks for a reminder, Heather. That'll that'll preach there, Mark. Um, that that was amazing. Thank you. And let me pass it over to Fred. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks, um, uh, Pastor Heather, Reverend Peter, and. Thank you, uh, Mark, who's not a reverend, but I do revere Mark and um, have enjoyed the uh, times on the uh, uh, demonstrations and public vigils together side by side. Um, uh, you know, during, um, during the pandemic uh, last year, um, my, my wife, Diana, and our uh, teenage daughter, who's a student at Albany High School, they um, volunteered at one of the uh, mass food distributions that uh, Mark organized along with Sister Betsy from Catholic Charities and the good people of the Regional Food Bank. And, um, and one of the things they told me was they were, they were up front at the line and, and were greeting people. And just like Mark had described in terms of welcoming people and letting them know what the process was and, and uh, just sort of making sure people feel comfortable and have the right uh, questions answered. And, um, you know, they shared with me uh, the story of this one man driving in a car and he, you know, he had tears in his eyes um, explaining that in his entire life, he has never gone to a food pantry and he's never waited online to receive food. And he's uh, always had a job and always put food on the table. And, uh, and he just said, he just, he was just so upset. He was just so confused and just so sad and embarrassed about being there that day. And I think about um, how Mark, Sister Betsy and others uh, in the capital region have been able to respond in this creative way through these drive-through food pantries or mass food distributions. Uh, and I think in many ways, you know, it we've seen that during this pandemic that many people who had been financially secure, people who had been middle-class, upper middle-class, uh, all of a sudden experienced food insecurity uh, and worries about paying for groceries or paying for their utilities, paying for groceries or paying their rent, paying for groceries or paying for healthcare. And a lot of people who had not really thought too much about these issues uh, around uh, access to food all of a sudden really found themselves in uh, a very challenging time. I think as people of faith, uh, we, 
we, we notice that our religious traditions offer us a perspective in which we are called to share our resources, not on the basis of who quote unquote deserves them, but rather on the basis of who needs them. So whether we are people of God, people of Allah, people of Yahweh, we see time and time again examples of how food and healthcare and housing and welcome and jobs, employment and pay is distributed on the basis of what people need rather on some perspective of what people deserve. And in some ways, this is very countercultural. Um, you know, uh, like Mark said, at, at many places when people try to get food, there's often an intake form where people are asked for their mm -hmm. zip code, for, you know, proof of residence and other information like that, that they may feel comfortable with or may feel uncomfortable with giving. Um, when people are seeking health care, and if they do not have an insurance policy, uh, again, they're going to be asked for all sorts of information. And if we think about it as people of faith, especially for those of us who are Christian, you know, when Jesus fed the 5,000, and again, back in those days, they only counted the men. So there's probably another 5,000 women and probably 10 or 20,000 kids. But when Jesus went to go feed those thousands of people, he didn't give his disciples clipboards and ask people to like fill out forms to make sure there aren't people trying to take advantage of this food that was being distributed, of this bread and fish. Uh, you know, Jesus didn't say to his disciples, make sure these people live in the right zip code to be able to access this. Um, when Jesus went to heal people who were, who were ill, people who were sick, Jesus, again, didn't tell his disciples, well, I want you to create a waiting room, and here's a five-page intake form, and we're going to need to get people's social security number and their date of birth and their this and their that uh, to see that they are worthy or deserving of the healing that I'm going to offer you. But instead, as, as people of faith, we see that how we share our resources, that we should be sharing that on the basis of what people need, and we shouldn't get caught up in sort of the mechanism to determine who quote unquote deserves food or deserves healthcare mm -hmm. or deserves housing or deserves employment. Um, you know, for many of us who are Christians, we're in this season of Easter and we've been reading a lot from the Acts of the Apostles. And we read time and time again, stories about how followers of Jesus are trying to meet the needs of people, especially those who are vulnerable, like orphans and widows and immigrants, and how they're distributing food and providing hospitality for others. And we are part of traditions where we have people like Basil the Great, who says that the bread that is in your cupboard belongs to those who are hungry, that the money that you have saved up and are not using, that belongs to the poor. And that extra coat you have in your closet belongs to the one who needs it. A time and time again, we're given witness and examples of how we're invited to share resources, share our food on the basis of need. And I think there's an intersection here that Mark points out, which is we can distribute food, which is a work of mercy, and that's wonderful but we also need to link it with works of justice. We need to raise the questions about the systems that are in place that promote food insecurity, those political systems and economic systems, many of which Mark outlined in his reflection. Um, and I think we need, we've seen that there's been a shift among the food pantry world where we used to talk about hunger a lot. Um, and the shift has gone from talking about hunger to talking about food insecurity, to see that it isn't just about one person having feeling hungry, but that we right. recognize that this is a system, it, that this is something that is uh, part of our society, unfortunately, and it's an injustice. And we also have 
uh, people in our community who invite us to think about this in terms of food justice, to really think about this in terms of systems of right and wrong, of what is ethical and what is moral and what is immoral. And some in our community are also inviting us to think about food apartheid. Food apartheid, to think about are, are there communities that have less access to food, to nutritious food, to fresh produce? Um, do, are there communities of people who don't have transportation to get those resources to be able to have healthy and nutritious meals? These are opportunities for us to engage as people of faith. And we can also look at creative ways that others have responded, whether they're coming from a faith tradition or not. So the mass food distributions, those drive-in food pantries that Mark described, that's a way for us as people of faith to engage in food distribution. We've seen in Albany the free fridge program, which is really awesome. This idea of just putting a refrigerator just out in the open on the sidewalk. So anyone can donate food, put it in that fridge, or can come by and take that, that food. Um, the church I go to, uh, the Shrine Church of Our Lady of the Americas, um, just put in a similar type of um, pantry. It's basically a 24 seven food pantry right by the church entrance. And it's, it's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Anyone can come and drop off groceries and anybody can come and pick up those groceries. We've seen restaurants where people, when they pay for their meal, they can also pay for someone else's meal, take the receipt, tape it on the wall, and someone who's hungry can come in, take that receipt and get a meal because someone else was generous. So we can look for creative ways that we can express our faith to express our love for our sister, our brother, our sibling, our neighbor. And, and as people of God, as people of Allah, people of Yahweh, um, that we can continue to work uh, to love tenderly, to walk humbly, and to act justly. Thanks. Thank you. Great. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you, Fred. I'm, I'm going to take the spotlight off, and if uh, some of you may need to shift over to gallery view, but that will give us a chance to see each other, and we're going to take a little time for uh, to respond and to ask questions and just to engage in conversation. Peter, were you going to jump in with a question there? Yeah, there is so much uh, rich material that was shared here today, and I'm just uh, so grateful to both of you for um, what you had to offer. Um, maybe I'll tee up with a question and then we'll we'll uh, go from there. I, you know, picking up on uh, Fred's uh, observation about how we provide pe for people based on what they need as opposed to what they deserve. I think uh, an example of this would be the, um, the 2.5 billion, which was allocated by the federal government for rent relief. And uh, what's really appalling right now <laughs> is that they're still fumbling in Albany trying to figure out how to get this money out the door and to give it to people. And one of the holdups is, is this kind of conversation about we do this program so that uh, somebody won't abuse it or rip it, rip it off so that we're sure that the money goes to people who really, uh, in their view, deserve it as opposed to need it. And uh, really that's the wrong question uh, that we need to be looking at here. And I just would say that, you know, to Mark's observation about wealth inequality, that when we give out um, tax breaks to Amazon about, uh, uh, we don't have that level of uh, rigor uh, right. in terms of giving money to them. Uh, and so it often feels as though uh, this, uh, the, the question of do you deserve it is a question reserved for poor people and do you need it 
is a question which is reserved for rich people. Yeah. Let's let's hear from other people here in the Zoom. Uh, questions or responses. Any question? Let's go for it. All right. You know, I sat here today and I could have sat here for hours. Thank you both um, for what you shared, uh, both Mark and Fred. And I don't know that I have questions, but just a sense of gratitude in helping me to think about things in a very different perspective. Um, one of the things that I think that we as a denomination, because we're doing Church USA, have been grappling with is how do we move from mission for to mission with? And I'm wondering if we can, um, is, can you shed a little light on how we might reinterpreting, reinterpret what we're doing around mission with for those who um, are facing food insecurity? Great. Uh, I too was could have sat could sit here for hours listening to that, and I think I took enough notes while both of you were speaking to remind me of my 1970s college career. <laughs> so, uh, a lot of which I will steal to share with uh, the people in my hometown, which is Messina. So I'm very appreciative of. Uh, Peter inviting, sending this invitation out. And, and uh, I hope this continues. And I hope to bring more people from my community to listen and share with, with this group. Thank you. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Fred or Mark, did one of you want to respond to the mission with uh, question? So sure. I could, oh, I'll go ahead, Fred. Yeah, no, you go, Mark. So one thing that we've um, done uh, with the people that are coming um, is uh, we've asked them if they want to help on another day and come and help. We've also did census forms. We did voter registration. We handed out stuff from United Tenants. We handed out stuff from the Poor People's Campaign. We um, did a bunch of that kind of work to uh, let people know about other resources, mental health, whatever. But one thing that we really, you know, exactly what you, we're trying to figure out with this community building effort, that's what it is. Like we're feeding folks who need to eat, but we're trying to build a new community that could say we can see a different world. And so it's the volunteers who are not all on the same page um, but we're trying to work shoulder to shoulder to influence one another and learn from one another and the people in the cars and, and walk up so we can, you know, we can get them together. So you, you see, you know, all sorts of walks of life, people doing this. Um, the, I'll tell you one story, Grafton State Park. I don't know if anybody, it's a big state park. We're down by the water and it's lined up all the way to Route 2. I mean, there was five, 600 cars lined up. and. Um, one car that came up uh, was not a car, it was a truck that was sort of like duct taped together. And um, they had a modern family in America of folks that were, you know, um, mixed race children and it's a modern family. And they had Black Lives Matter, All Lives Matter, Blue Lives Matter, Donald Trump, etc., on the same damn truck. And so I don't, this was a chance to talk to them. And so to me, that's, that, that's, that, and that's part of this thing too. I didn't view them as, I viewed them as my sisters and brothers. And how could we talk to you about this? How could we get like do this and work shoulder to shoulder to make a better world? And so we're trying to get them, get people involved. One person I know who comes actively to do this also brings a box home all the time to his family because he can't feed his family. So we're trying to get that that whole thing together. So even in the distribution, the mass distribution of food, that part of what 
I mean, this is not surprising knowing your background, Mark, but you see that not just as emergency aid, you see that as an organizing tool. Yes, and I, and you know, I mean, I gotta give credit. Like I said, Sister Betts, I've been doing organizing since, you know, I was 13 in 1970 and around Vietnam. I've been involved with stuff. And um, Betsy Mendusen is one of the best organizers I've ever worked with. One thing, she organizes to get the work done. If you need to paint a wall and you get a bunch of people to help you, but at the end of the day, the wall's not painted, you're not really a good organizer. And she's not painting it by herself. She's getting people involved. The other side of good organizing is get people involved. Give them responsibility. Ask them questions about what they would do different. That kind of thing. And we're just seeing it, you know, like um, this expand now because it's not on Saturday and Sunday because the regional food bank is killing themselves to distribute this food all over the place. We're doing this in 11 counties. They're doing this in 23 counties. We've done over 120, 130 of these things. They've done 400 of these things. So their truckers are leaving at five, six o'clock in the morning, driving to Sydney and Skenevis and here, there and everywhere. Plattsburgh. They're doing this. So to ask them to do it on Saturday and Sunday is hard. So you got a lot of retirees. How do we get young people? How do we get like people? So what we've done is anytime there's a school break, anytime, spring, summer, whatever, winter, to, to get those schools, the teachers associations, the support staff, and every single student that you could possibly grab to be involved in this, because they walk away saying, this is the right thing to do. And we need to do, they learn about the need and they learn about what they, what Fred was, this is all our responsibility. I could easily sit and watch television every night and say, damn government, but that doesn't fulfill my responsibility. Yeah. I could, you know, so that's a, that's the thing. And that I think, I think it's been good for everybody. This is Gary again. And I think that you hit on something that's very important and, and, in the things that I participate in, I find that it's a, somewhat of a barrier, and that is recruiting more people and recruiting new leadership. And what, what happens very often is, is that uh, it's older people that do it, and not necessarily even older people, but they just get to a saturation point and get tired, and the program doesn't fulfill and expand to the capacity that would make a tremendous difference in the community. So we also, I, I, I'm interested by, to me, this is very provocative to think about a way, I, I hear what you're doing with the mass distribution. What about the, what'd you say, 500 plus, you know, churches, community centers, whatever, that have small standing food pantries in them how can we be more than government contractors? In other words, we are here for the purpose of providing a service that's funded by the federal government or by the state government or by the county, and you have to qualify for it. And we then become the gatekeepers to that, not our rules, but because of the government rules, we take down that information, right? And how do we, move beyond becoming a piece of an ongoing infrastructure of maintaining food injustice, right, in, in the United States? And how do we move to what you're talking about, you're doing with the mass distributions of having the pantry itself be an organizing tool to engaging people with an analysis of the problem and working towards a solution? Well, so I, I work with um, three different pantries um, and they're all different. So the one I know most about I'm on the board of is Oakwood and o Oakwood, um, you know, it's probably since 19, the, since the late 18, 18, 1980s is when it was established. And when the pandemic happened, the people that were there as the, the volunteers were elderly folks and they stayed home. 
right? So we had to get quickly and right away young people who now have stayed and now the uh, folks that were older have come back and that we've really are starting to build something. We used to be, it was an emergency thing for just Saturdays. And you can only come one time a month. You could be from anywhere in Troy, Waterbury, anywhere. You can cross the river. You can swim across the river if you wanted to. But it was, um, you only come once a month. Now we're doing it twice a month. And now we're going to go to Wednesday nights. And last summer we delivered food. We're doing the same thing. Census, United Tenants, all of those kinds of things. And, and other things that we're doing at, at, at that pantry. Um. And we try to do the minimum of what the government requires us to do. There's 65 food pantries in Albany, Schenectady, and Rensselaer County that are part of the food pantries for the Capital District. Um, Mount Ida is another one I work with in Troy. I'm bringing them food. We're going to do some concrete work for them and stuff for um, so it can be handicapped accessible. We're doing that kind of stuff with them. They're on a, a more beginning sort of basis, even though they've been around for a while. They're, and then then you have like the, the great St. Vincent de Paul in Albany where, you know, they're doing just tremendous work. And another great organizer, Angela Warner is like, you know, has really got it down where volunteers and a whole group of people are doing it, including the people coming to it. And they're doing stuff like training, um, they have a lot of Afghan immigrants and other people that they're working with on all sorts of different kinds of levels. So I think the food pantries, which started years ago, is a great idea. Now, many years later, people are starting to think, how do we change this so we don't have to do this? And I don't mean so we, got, so, so we could do something else to help somewhere else. But how, how do we change this? I was at the 40th anniversary luncheon several years ago for the food pantries of the capital district and someone got up and said here's to an elected official who'll go nameless here's to another 40 years well that would stink right <laughs> if you had another 40 years of this poverty and i think uh, whoever said it i don't know it's not just hunger that we're talking about now if you don't have health care if you don't have mental health care if you don't have housing if you don't have stuff for your kids to do it's not, and it's also not just get a job, get a job. Like, you know, you're 80. It ain't a job that's helping that you need. Hard work, just work hard. People are working around the clock hard. And um, no, every, nobody wants a job any longer. That's not true. We have now in the capital region, a lower amount of unemployment than we had in April, than we had in January. People are not, they're not going back to the jobs that paid because you got some other jobs that you could get. People are going into construction jobs and things like that. So it's like, there's all these myths you gotta take on and we have to take on, I, I can't feel guilty because I'm working hard or I had something happen in my life that I'm today not able to feed myself. I have to get over that guilt. I gotta look at everyone in the face exactly the same as they are looking at me. We have to say, this, we inherited this problem. How can we fix it? And you, my sisters and brothers, have to fix it with us and, and get over the shame that's involved in it and the, the, you know, the internalization of it. I did something wrong. So I'm just finding this all so helpful. Um, I, I wanted to just key back to um, Sandana's question about uh, mission with, um, which is really sticking in my head here, to say that <clears throat> I think that the church a lot of times kind of keeps to itself. And what the, the one of the biggest mission with things that the church can do is to show up and get to know people like Mark Emanation and all these other programs out there uh, and then ask, how can we work together and how can we help? So I think that always needs to be the posture of, of, of the church. And then secondly, is how do we as a church not uh, get so caught up in the charity aspects of what we do, which are important and I don't want to negate them, 
but also lead people to address these questions in a more structural kind of way. I don't know how many uh, pastors out there can tell you the story of having some earnest volunteer in their church who shows up every week in the food pantry uh, who is completely invested in coming back the next week and is not terribly interested in asking the question as to why people are showing up in the food pantry in the first place. It's more about their ego or their identity that they can do this and fixing a larger structural problem. So I do think that is um, a pastoral challenge that our churches have right now to not get so siloed and to work together and to get out in the community to address structural change. Well, with that, it's according to my clock, 1258, and part of our practice is going to be to um, end on time. But I want to just, uh, we, we were hoping to end with just a little bit of feedback on this process itself. I really appreciated both of our speakers today. And um, I also thought maybe I can feel like we're just kind of getting going on some good conversation. And it seems to me we could have at least another 10 minutes of, of actually engaging. Um, would anybody like to give any other feedback? And then also we'd be interested in hearing about other topics that um, you might be interested in having us do a, a faith and public life forum on. Yeah, Paul. Um, I would appreciate maybe the next, the next forum focusing on ways that food pantries around the country, uh, if they have done so, have become organizations or centers for political action. Um, because that's obviously what what needs to happen. I, I, no, I shouldn't say obviously, but that's one way that we could begin, that, that folks could begin to address the systemic issues, which are the issues, um, you know, the, 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 the vast terrible uh, disparity uh, between rich and poor and, and you know, the, the tax laws and all this stuff. And so, um, you know, if, if we could have some, some, uh, I, I know, uh, schooling on, on becoming um, centers of uh, political action, or at least community organization, uh, beyond just distributing food, uh, community organization that w could be uh, exciting uh, and would have the benefit, I think, for, for um, younger folks to get involved, uh, who want to be, be involved in our churches, for example, that are doing something like that to make, to, to work on systemic changes. Um, I mean, if we could take that step in some future forum, yeah. I think that, that could be very attractive. Yeah, definitely. And there's, Lot, lot to be said on that. So um, let's, Peter, we'll make note of, of that and it'd be an interesting conversation to pursue other comments. Well, my uh, comment was very similar. How do you use this uh, uh, food distribution network to increase the awareness and recognition of uh, the systemic issues of uh, healthcare and housing and and mental illness and substance abuse treatment and and a whole host of uh, uh, other things. $15 an hour is a goal, but it's really not a living wage anymore. And and by, by the time we get that and achieve it, it's gonna be behind yeah. as it is right now. Yeah. yeah. Other comments before we wrap yes. up? Uh, I, 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 go ahead. I, I live in Ithaca and I'm with the area congregations together and we're um, getting more involved with um, Bread for the World, uh, you know, national um, advocacy and be happy to uh, build collaboration with uh, the rest of you. Oh, that would be a, a good uh, thing to feature too at a, first, a future forum is the 
Bread for the World advocacy work uh, and get someone to speak on, on that. Thank you, Jim, for that. I appreciate that. Well, one of the things we wanted to be sure to do at the end of each forum is to leave people with a few things that they could do. Um, so I'm uh, going to suggest that um, if you live in Albany, that you pay attention to the good cause eviction bill, which is before the city council and call up your council person and ask them to please move that bill to the agenda. It means that landlords have to give a good reason as to why they are going to evict somebody. And it's also a way to help uh, improve uh, the quality of the property uh, where we deal with a lot of blight in Albany. Secondly, we need all hands on deck right now to pass the New York Health Act, uh, which would probably do more than just about anything I can think of to address wealth inequality, address health outcomes, um, and uh, ensure that everybody is getting serious health insurance coverage, which is not the case right now. Um, and I guess the only other thing I would say for those who are in New York City right now is there's a bill called Intro 146, which will raise the value of the housing voucher in New York City which is a very broken program right now and we need to get this passed. That would do more to get people into permanent housing than just about anything I can think of in New York City. And um, so those are just a few suggestions. So, you know, New York State Council of Churches publishes on our newsletter these kinds of actions all the time and uh um we uh you know would invite you to you know take a look at that thank you all so much for your time today and thanks especially to mark and fred thank Bravo. You. have a good thank afternoon so everyone. Much. thanks everyone. thanks everybody thank you